Matthew 22, 1-14 The Parable of the Wedding Banquet Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the street and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants to tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there'll be no weeping where there'll, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are invited but few are chosen great to hear from Callista there i'm just going to pray for um, phil before he brings our message for us about that passage uh, lord we thank you for um, every single story in the bible thank you for every single thing that we read in there and this is another one that we kind of look to make sense of we look to understand lord and we pray that tonight as phil shares about this and and um, unpacks it for us that we'll all gain the full understanding that you want us to have lord we pray that you will speak through phil and that uh, your glory will be seen throughout all that is said about this passage Thank you, Lord. Amen. So we're looking tonight at Matthew 22. It's the parable of the wedding banquet in this uh, series that we're going through. Jesus told a similar parable, but, very, but actually a different parable in Luke 14. There it was to a great supper that many were invited and various ones gave excuses why they couldn't attend. Here it's a wedding feast. It's prepared by a king for his son and people are invited and it's in two parts the first deals with the invitations and the guests who respond and the second part deals with one guest in particular who isn't wearing a wedding garment it's i think it's one of the most powerful of all of the lord's parables and it's got far-reaching implications for us today and I think understanding the timing of the parable is crucial. Jesus told the parable in the last week of his life. This is the Wednesday before he was crucified. On the Monday, he'd ridden into Jerusalem. He'd cleansed, he, sorry, he'd, he'd ridden into Jerusalem and, and was welcomed by the people. But they were looking for a, a military messiah. Who would free them from Roman rule and that's what they were hoping for. On the Tuesday he went into the temple and he overthrew the money changers and the sellers of animals and he cleansed the temple. On the Friday he'll be crucified and then on the Sunday he'll rise again and this is the Wednesday before the crucifixion and he's back in the temple and he's teaching and he's preaching and he's he's brought to these people for over three years everything that God wanted them to have so they saw his miracles they saw his power they saw his raising the dead they saw him and heard about him commanding the sea uh, to be still he created things on a massive scale food turned water into wine he cast out demons he spoke the most profound truths that had been heard. So the leaders and the people had all the evidence that they needed that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Son of God. 
And after three years of witnessing all of those things, they were now without excuse. But they continued to re reject him. And in particular, the leaders, they, they challenged his authority. They, they refused to believe in him. And they would not respond with, with a repentant heart and faith. And they said a very definite no to Jesus. And they not only rejected him, the leaders plotted to kill him. And many of the people joined in with that because they didn't want a Messiah who spoke of spiritual cleansing and repentance and lordship. That, that, that wasn't the Messiah that, that, that they prepared, they were prepared to follow. So Jesus told this parable to them, and it's one of three parables in Matthew 21 and uh, 22. We, we, we're not going to look at those other two, but they both, they all three had a, had a similar theme. They all spoke of judgment. What they basically said was this, you have rejected me, all of my teaching and my healings, and now I reject you. You've had opportunity after opportunity. You've had warning after warning. And now this is your time of judgment. When each of us were children, I'm sure we would have had many warnings from our parents at some stage. You know, if you do that one more time, you'll go to your roof. If you don't eat your peas, you won't have your pudding, that sort of thing. And unfortunately, as parents, we're not always consistent with our warnings. You know, we'll say something like, for the last time, this is your final warning. I mean, how many final warnings do you give? Where's our consistency? Well, this parable told the nation of Israel that they had had their final warning and judgment was coming. Now, they could still repent. They could still turn to Jesus as their Messiah individually because of God's grace. But as a nation, Jesus was saying, you have rejected me over and over and over again. And now I reject you. The time has come for me to throw open the gates of the kingdom to all people, far and wide, and offer salvation to all. That's the essence of this parable. It's very solemn, it's very dramatic, and very far-reaching parable. It is a reminder, isn't it, that actually God's patience has a limit. It's not that he, he becomes impatient, like we do in our sinful nature. But there is a time when God gives people up to their unbelief. It's as though he withdraws his hand of grace. And he says, okay, you've really, you, you reject, you reject, you reject, you reject. Now, I give you over to that. So let me just introduce three people who represent lots of other people. The first I'll, I'll call Craig. Craig's been a Christian for quite a while now, and he loves the Lord. But he struggles to really understand God as his heavenly father, a, a father who loves him unconditionally. So Craig tends to think of God as, as someone hard to please. And he often feels that he has to prove himself to God, to please God, to deserve God's blessing. And so he often feels guilty that he should be doing more. Maybe there's a bit of Craig in all of us at times. And then there's Sophie. I'm going to call her Sophie. And Sophie is also a Christian. And like Craig, she says that she loves the Lord. But unlike Craig, she doesn't struggle at all with the thought of God as her heavenly father. She actually has gone too far with that thought, so has become rather careless with some areas of her life because, well, she knows that God's loving. God will always forgive her. So she's become rather lax in some areas of her life with some sins, and they've just become part of her life. 
And over the years, other things have become more enjoyable and interesting to her. More interesting than actually worshipping God and reading the word of God and pray. But she still follows the Lord, but she doesn't really have close fellowship with him. Now, what would God have to say to Sophie tonight? What would God have to say to Craig tonight? And thirdly, there's you and me in our particular situation. What would God have to say to us tonight in the different areas of our lives, of our Christian lives? There are four different aspects of this wedding feast. I just want to briefly look at them. The first of all, the first is the banquet prepared. Verse 2 and verse 3. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And uh, that marriage there is better translated a wedding banquet as, as the NIV has. And sent out his servants to call those who were invited in the wedding, to the wedding rather, and they were not willing to come. Now in this parable, the king is God. The son is Jesus. The wedding and the wedding feast represent the kingdom of God, where God reigns and rules as king. And those invited are the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. Now, a wedding banquet prepared by a king for his son would have been the greatest celebration those people could have imagined in their culture. It was a banquet thrown by the wealthiest the most generous person that they, they knew. And it would have been a celebration of celebrations. And that feasting, it probably would have gone on for days, maybe a week or more. And to be invited to, to an occasion like that, that would have been a great honour, the greatest honour imaginable. No greater privilege than to be invited to the king's son's wedding. And what a lovely, lovely picture of a generous God who loves his son and who loves his subjects and who spares nothing to lay on the most fabulous feast for them. I mean, this wasn't a, an invitation to a light lunch or to a fish and chip supper. Well, some might say that's a banquet. This, this was a great feast. You know, this was a banquet to end all banquets. It, it was a, it, it's provided by God the King for all who become part of his kingdom, who share in the riches that he's prepared for them. God has provided a lavish banquet that every believer in Christ is welcomed to partake of. And that's what God does, doesn't he? He, he gives us richly from his vast resources of love, his grace and power, his peace, his joy, his strength, whatever we go through, he cares more deeply than we can ever imagine because of his love. And I think this picture of the feast or the language of feast, it's not just talking about having a good time, it's talking about that total satisfaction that our relationship with God brings that satisfies the deepest hunger that's known to our, to our hearts, which our souls were created for, and which deep down we all long for. So what would God say to Craig, who struggles to understand God as a loving Heavenly Father, often feels he's got to prove himself to God, to deserve his love and blessing? I believe God would remind Craig through this par parable that God, he is an abundantly generous God. You know, he's a God of lavish grace. The Christian life isn't about what we give to God. It's about what God gives to us. It's about what God wants to pour into our lives, the riches of his love to us, the totally undeserving. You know, it's Satan who seeks to distort our view of God, that God's a, somehow a grasping God, an uncaring God, a harsh God a taskmaster. It's the devil who's the thief and the liar. The devil seeks to rob, 
and kill and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you, that they, you might have life and have it to its full. And that's what this banquet represents. It's, it's life in all of its fullness and abundance. And you know, one day, eternally, it will find its ultimate fulfillment in what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. When, when, when we, the church, the bride, will be presented spotless to Christ. The bridegroom, we're thinking a little bit about that, or touched a little bit about that uh, this morning in that message by Matthew. So, first of all, the banquet prepared. Secondly, the invitation rejected. Verse 3. This is the king. And sent out his servant to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. So that's verse, uh, verse 3 of that. Now, the servants were sent to call those who were invited to the wedding. So these people had already received their invitation. In, in those days, uh, people didn't have watches and they didn't have diaries. And great wedding feasts like this one prepared by the, the king for his son, it couldn't be prepared to an exact time. So a preliminary invitation would have been sent out some, some while before. And people would have responded. So the people of Israel were the already invited ones. The Old Testament law, law and the Old Testament prophets pointed to Jesus. They prepared Israel, the people, to welcome their king, the Messiah. To be part of this great wedding banquet prepared by God for them. And finally, God sent John the Baptist after centuries to give the invitation to the wedding feast and to honour the son. They couldn't have been better prepared by God. And then it says, and I think it's easy to miss this, if you look at verse 4, again, he sent out another servant saying, Tell those who are in the see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted calf, car, cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. So the invitations went out for another time, a third time. And perhaps this referred to Jesus himself preaching the kingdom, offering himself as their Messiah. And it just goes to show again the generosity, the kindness, the patience of God. And what happened? Verse 5 tells us. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. It's, it's unbelievable that those who had been invited again and again and again wouldn't come. They refuse the invitations. And I, I imagine that there would have been gasps of surprise, surprise and a disbelief in the crowd. I mean, to say no to a king's invitation, to the wedding of his son, to be an honoured guest and an invited guest would have been absolutely unthinkable. And some, I think, would have been thinking to themselves, this is too far-fetched. No one would ever do that. To turn down such an honour and insult the king like that, that just doesn't make sense. Just imagine when um, Prince William and, and Kate were being married and the royal family decided that they'd reserve one place of honour at the wedding and the red wedding reception for one person in the country picked at random. And you were the one person to be drawn out of the hat of all 60 million people in this country. And there's lots of publicity and everything's laid on ready for the day. But on the morning of the wedding, you look in your TV magazine and there's a favourite programme on the television at the same time as the wedding. And you think to yourself, well, I don't want to miss that. I'll stay at home instead. Well, this parable would have been just as shocking as that. 
Or maybe it's raining outside and you think, well, I've just bought a lovely <laughs> wedding suit for this reception. I, I don't want to get it wet. And you decide not to go. It would be unthinkable and un inconceivable to do that. And that's what these people in the parable had done. Verse 5, if you look at verse 5, it says, they made light of it. They made light of it. They, they just went about their daily work. One to his farm, another to his business. And the Greek wording there means that they, they were just unconcerned, utterly indifferent. They just walked away. They found other things more interesting. Not bad things, just other things that were more enjoyable to them. You know, I'm sure their unbelief and indifference hadn't come all at once, but gradually, as they closed their ears to the voice of God, slowly stopped listening to their consciences until their, their hearts had become hardened and they could no longer hear. And because of that, they totally missed out on the king's banquet for his son. So what would God say to Sophie through that? We thought of a bit earlier. She'd allowed things to slip back into her life. Things weren't, which weren't the best for her. For whom hearing the word of God and prayer and worship it hadn't been the priority. She sort of, other things had become more interesting and more enjoyable. And I believe God would say to her what he said in Hebrews 3 about the dangers of becoming hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Even as a child of God, you know, sin, it, it promises so much to us, doesn't it? You know, we, when we're tempted, there's a, a sense of ooh, a satisfaction and a fulfillment in the sin. But instead, it just brings emptiness and it brings dissatisfaction. And it, I mean, if it's unconfessed and left, it leads to hardness of heart. You know, no one starts off by deciding to have a hard heart. It happens slowly and gradually and drifting away from our love for God begins with small steps of compromise and unbelief. And there's danger that we become insensitive to sin just through closing our ears to God's voice. And so God's message, I believe, to Sophie would be for her to discover the joy and thrill of obedience. To reading the word of God and to prayer and to worshipping God and to enjoy and, and begin enter into the enjoyment of that, the, the, the delight of that. And to start with small new steps of obedience. It's never too late to do that. Because God's promise is there, isn't it? Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. We can be overfaced sometimes if we feeling that way out that we'll never get back or never change something. But Take a small step tonight of obedience in some area. That would be God's message to Sophie and to us. And then verse 6, the parable went from bad to worse. Verse 6 says, And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. And those listening, they'd be thinking, now, now this has just got ridiculous. They've attacked the king's servants who brought them their invites and killed them. That's beyond belief. Th this wasn't just indifference. This was actual outright hostility. This was rebellion against the king. And it says in verse 7, But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And I think those, those listening will be applauding the king's rightful anger and retribution for, for, their, for this rebelliousness. Now, this actually was a, a, a prophecy of what would happen in a few years' time, in AD 70, when the Roman army marched through Palestine, they conquered Jerusalem, because of Israel's rebelliousness against Rome, 
and on the orders of the emperor, the Roman army demolished the entire city of Jerusalem and the temple. Over a million Jews were killed. So this was a prophecy of God's judgment on the Jewish nation because of their outright rejection of their Messiah, because they'd rejected him. God had rejected them. So the banquet prepared to the um, invitation rejected three, the kingdom expanded. Verse 10, verse eight rather through to 10. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So something new has happened. The offer of the kingdom has now been taken away from the nation that rejected it. And it's being offered to a new people. Who are the new people? It's to you and me. The king literally says to his servants, just go everywhere, wherever people are, to the byways, the highways, invite everybody. Go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel and make disciples. As many as you can find, whether they're morally good or morally bad, it doesn't matter, invite them all. And isn't that the heart? Of the gospel message. God wants all to be part of his family, whether good or bad. And it's as though he scours the earth to share his love with all who will, who will respond to his gracious invitation because he's that sort of God. And you know, that, that, that's actually happening today. Throughout the world, we've heard some amazing things that God has been doing, even among the persecuted world, where people are rejected just for being Christians and yet God is building his church the gospel is going out that's what's happening in Bradford too in the hospitals and in the council and in the workplaces and in our neighborhoods God's seeking he's ready to be found and every day he's saying everything is ready come that's isn't that the gospel call that's the whosoever God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes. And, and Jesus mentions that call again, right at the end of the parable, verse 14. And he adds this, he says, for many are called, but few are chosen. The gospel invitation goes out to many, but only few are chosen. So Jesus shows there that God is sovereign over salvation. He's sovereign over those who come and respond to that invitation. They come, that word says, because they've been chosen by him. Yet every person who receives the invitation is free to respond and to accept that invitation or free to reject the invitation. You know, we must never think that God is frustrated that more don't accept his invitations. Because when his invitation comes to come to him, God is completely in charge. But it's interesting, isn't it? In that parable, we get one verse about God's sovereignty and we get 13 verses about our responsibility to respond to the invitation and to being there. So the emphasis in the parable is overwhelmingly on our responsibility to respond to the invitation. Because God's sovereignty, his control never takes away from our responsibility. The two things are always side by side in the Bible. You, we can't separate them. They always go together. And, and that's a mystery. We'll never be able to fathom. But we believe it to be true. Because... The Bible tells us it's true. And so the kingdom was expanded to include everyone, Jews and Gentiles, and thrown open to all. And 
it'd be great, wouldn't it, if the parable had ended there. I mean, what a wonderful way to end the story. You know, there's no sting in the tale, but there is. What do you make of verses 11 to 13? An intruder is found at the wedding. But when the king came to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. He said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the fourth point is this, the intruder expelled. Here's a person who thought he belonged. He, he thought his name was on one of those place cards, you know, around the, ta the wedding reception tables to tell you, tell you where to sit. And he looked, <laughs> but there was no place for him. He found out too late he didn't belong. He didn't have the right wedding clothes on. Now, some suggest that the king in those days would have provided an outer garment for every guest to wear, a, a clean garment to put over their ordinary clothes. I mean, after all, all, all those who came had come in from the highways and the byways and the, there would have been dirty clothes on, they wouldn't have had time to change. But there was one person who'd refused to wear the king's garment. That had been offered. He refused and that refusal showed his contempt in his heart for his host and would have been an insult to the king. And so the king said to him, friend, how, how did you come in here without a wedding gown? And it says he was speechless and his speechless showed his defiance of his sovereign, that he arrogantly believed he didn't need to wear anything other than his own clothes. And the king instructed his servants, bind him, hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus is here, he, he, in love, he's warning of the judgment and of the finality and the futile remorse that there is in hell for those who despise God's grace and reject Christ. I think this intruder is uh, someone today who on the surface is a believer, part of the church, calls themselves a Christian, is involved with the church, but has never, ever been born again by the Spirit of God. They've never received from God the garment that he's offered them. And what's the garment that's offered? Well, if we just go back to Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 20. Matthew 5, verse 20, where Jesus says this. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What is it that's necessary for us to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's righteousness, isn't it? Not the righteousness of the Pharisees, that's self-righteousness, our own righteousness, but a God-given perfect righteousness. And the Jews listening to Jesus, they would have understood that. They would have, they would have been familiar with, with what I think is one of the most beautiful texts in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Isaiah 61 and verse 10 says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That's a lovely Old Testament, New Testament themed verse. And the king looked at this man and he saw no righteousness. 
because the man had refused the king's gift, the garment for the wedding. And the man was thrown out. How do we get the righteousness that this man was offered but refused? Well, it's through faith, isn't it? Romans 3, 21, verse 22 tells us that. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. You know, when we come to receive Christ by faith, the moment we receive him, we receive the righteousness of God. That's the robe we put on. Christ puts it on us. It's a beautiful robe of righteousness. It's the holiness of Jesus. How do you know that you're saved? How do, what, what, what's your assurance? How, how can you be assured that you're saved? Well, there's different ways, but perhaps the most defining one is that we are seeking to live a life that's consistent with us wearing that robe of righteousness. You see, grace not only forgives and clothes us with righteousness, it also transforms us. And that brings assurance of salvation. The, the 17th century Puritan, a man called Thomas Goodwin, he said that all assurance that is true assurance maketh a man holy. All assurance that is true assurance makes a man holy. And he was right. The assurance, true assurance that a Christian has will always be accompanied by a growing faith and a growing holiness of life. So that we are always ready for when the Lord comes again. Because then we'll begin the full marriage feast of the Lamb. And we should always seek to live in readiness, readiness for that. So what would God say to you and me tonight through this? It's this, with this I close. We should seek to live now as those who are ready for the wedding feast, ready for Christ's return. Wherever we find ourselves, we've got to be ready now. God says that to Craig and he says that to Sophie and he says that to you and to me. In the different areas of our Christian lives, we need to be living now, ready for his return, to share in his wedding banquet. Let's pray. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word shines your light into our lives. Lord, thank you that you have reminded us in this uh, parable that you are such a generous God, a giving God, God full of generosity. We thank you, Lord, for this wedding feast that you want us to share in and look forward to in all of its fullness. And we partake of that in small measure now, but wonderful measure. We enjoy the, the beautiful presence of Christ in our lives and all of the riches that he brings. And Lord of God, we pray that you'd help us not to presume upon your patience, not to presume upon your goodness by letting sin reign over us in any area of our lives. Your word tells us that do you not know that the goodness of God leads to repentance and, and the patience of God leads to repentance. And so, God, we pray, help us to be sensitive to those areas of our lives, maybe that we've let slip in any way, where we've allowed things a little bit of compromise. Lord, we don't want to let into our lives little bits of hardness that will result in a hard heart. And so, Lord, we come to you in faith and ask that you'd help us, Lord, to see what small steps of obedience we might take to put things right. Help us to live each day and night in a responsive love and in loving obedience with deep gratitude and love and praise to you. And to be always ready to 
for our Saviour's return as Lord of all, because he is Lord. And we ask this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.